But now it is time to get into another random character. This is going to put us up to four for the week, and every week's goal is to make a party and an adventure through which we put them. Almost like we're writing a module. And you may remember last week we created an area for our heroes to explore. And that area has been fleshed out. Here's a, a quick summary of what I had ended up writing for it. Now, you will find on the channel, um, when I updated it earlier, I put a rather long <laughs> a long piece, and that is the story that we, you know, me and chat, you, if, it, if you're involved or if you're not, hey, you, you can be a part of all of these characters and locations. Just come along for the ride. You can lurk. You can comment. You can ask questions. Uh, but this is what we did last night, and I just made it a little bit more formal. I, I just kind of, you know, put that out there, and um, we made an entire environment, a society. We made an economy. We made something that makes sense and it works. It could provide for the people who live there, and it includes all the troubles and strife that the people who live there um, encounter, because that that's what happens, right? And so then... This location was made on the three adventures we had made so far this week. And those are these two. Uh, we started with uh, Rin, Rin Bobak here. And then we made Falco Steady Hand. Last night, we ended up making Jermaine Sweet Tea Swift as well. And we took, uh, yeah, I, I forgot to upload a, a picture here. I'll find something on the break. Uh, but we took her concept and we were able to find instances in the other characters that would say oh well this must exist because if we're creating characters that are going to be together they have to be close by well here we had randomly rolled that Jermaine was an urchin well it so happens that Rin up here was also an urchin right so we knew that a city had to exist as well by being a ranger and they get specialties in different types of environments here we had coast, forest, and mountain. So this is indicating there must be something nearby that encompasses these three natural aspects. Well, lo and behold, that same night, we randomly rolled into another ranger, though this one was a beast master. And so Falco here randomly had the Underdark and a coast of some kind. So there we go. Uh, and then, you know, we had Jermaine as well. So we had two cities, two coasts. And... Then we had an Underdark. Well, that leads to mountains as well, right? Because you can have uh, tunnels under mountains. And does Underdark have to mean the Underdark of Forgotten Realms? Or can it just mean there's a large cavernous uh, area, lots of caves, um, maybe some mining and whatnot going on? And so, boom, those two kind of combo together there. And then we had a forest as well. Well, there's a lot of forests that are nearby mountains as just a part of um, geography and nature and, and how that works. And it was easy to add in a forest. So you can see through, uh, even before we got into MS Paint, <laughs> we had an entire region set up. And then we could start thinking about, well, there's a lot of urchins here. What's going on? And, and if we have Underdark, what does that mean? And what can we base things off of? And anyway, uh, those, those are going to get up probably later tonight. Um, I wasn't able to put them up earlier. Uh, I actually run an open game at my store here in Ohio. And uh, we're going through Curse of Strahd, and I wanted to make sure I was super pre uh, prepared for it. So I, I spent the day uh, going over things. Because, interestingly enough, uh, I, have f I have 14 people who show up for that game, and it's amazing. And I'll tell you, you can still run um, you can still run a game with 14 people. Now, not everyone's going to get character development, you know, like a, a spotlight on them. But we're here to tell a story. Everyone was laughing. We were all having a great time. I wore some props and did some voices. It was it was great. So we're going to carry this momentum. And without having that um, necessarily affect who this character is, we can project forward some ties that bind uh, the rest of the party and the geography where this adventure is taking place into the character as we develop him or her. Now, if you have been here with us for, heck, even one night, you'll know that there is a, a procedure that I made to be able to randomly roll a character. 
that is over here. Bum -ba -dum. Here we go. We're going to bring up the handy dandy dice roller right here. And we're going to start by determining if the character is male, female, or a multi-class character, and then re-roll for gender. 1 to 45 is female, 46 to 90 is male, and a 91 to 100 is a multi-class character. Here's our percentile, 1d100, we're going to roll it. 54, this is going to be a male, and a male what? We're going to roll 2d10, if the, uh, if the first roll, well, we can just do it twice here. If the first roll is 10, we're going to re-roll. And then the second one is going to be an odds or evens to determine which subrace uh, which sub race exists or uh, is going to define our character. First roll is a 2. Our second roll is an 8. So this is going to be race number 2 and sub subrace 2. Coming down here, we see this is elf. This is going to be a wood elf. Male wood elf. Next up, we're going to determine the alignment of this character. To do that, we're going to roll two D100s to represent each of the axes. Good, neutral, evil, law, neutral, chaos. Hit roll. 56 and 75. So 56 is uh, almost tickling neutral, right? So we're still good. And then 75 is going to put us into the neutral range. So we have a neutral good character. Now, when I created this, this is my own standard distribution or my own probabilities about the kind of people that we are going to be producing on this uh, on this channel. It's going to be more heavily skewed towards good, right? We have a 60% chance of good, 30% chance of neutral, and only a 10% chance for evil. And then in each of these, I said, well, if someone's good, they're most likely going to be, you know, neutral good and... I was, I was creating a, a, pro, a probability of a population in my head. You can take these numbers and you can adjust them some other way if you want. All right, that was alignment number four. Next, we're going to determine the level of the character with 1D100. Change that over to a 1. Let's, gonna, let's hit roll. 11. This is going to be... Here we go, a level four character. Hey, we're gonna get our first ability score. So there's gonna be X, Y, and level four. Okay. Now, before we get into the class, a level four what? We need to determine if this character uses feats at all. And we're gonna do that with a percentile roll. 56. With a 56, you can see here, this is uh, stat bumps only, ASIs, or ability score improvements. So at level 4, when we get an ASI, we're going to drop it right into a score of some kind. Okay, that was our feat. Now we're going to determine class, and we're going to do that with a D12. Right down here, it's the yellow one. Hit roll. 3. Oh, hey, we have a cleric. Nice. We need a healer, right? 1d8 domain, and we're going to re-roll an 8 if we get it. Here's our d8, this kind of bluish-purple one. Hit it. This is going to be an 8, so we're going to hit re-roll. A 3. Let's check down here. Here's our clerics. 1, 2, 3. Should we just put light? No need to make things complicated. There we go. Boom. Level seven's done, or step seven is done. We've we can pass by all this. There's only a couple more things to do now. We need a background, and to do that, we need to roll a 13-sided die. Uh, there that is manufactured. You can get one. Though in here in the dice roller, boom, we just made a 13-sided die. Hit roll. Roll number one. 
this is going to be background one, which is an acolyte. Hey, I get, I guess this writes itself, right? <laughs> now, acolytes don't have any kind of other consideration. Like a charlatan here, there's six different types of charlatan that you could be. An acolyte in this case is you're an acolyte, and that's going to kind of bleed over more into, um, in this case, the domain that he's following. So he's still on this journey, perhaps, to be not just an acolyte who's now a fully fledged cleric of this uh, of this faith, but he wants to go on for perhaps greater things. Though we are going to have two personality traits, and then we're going to need to roll a d6 three times for an ideal, a bond, and a flaw. Come back down here to d8, change that to two. Let's change the d6 to three. We're going to hit this first. One and four. I'm only putting the numbers in as placeholders. We'll come back and write it. Right now, I want to keep things moving, and we're going to populate it. Uh, that way, uh, we can procedurally generate a story together uh, instead of having to take breaks. Everything can just flow as we're getting a greater sense of the character. So one and four, and then we're going to hit our 3d6. Bada boom. This is going to be a one, a two, and a six. Now, a few more details. As we come down here on page two. Here is our wood elf physical dimensions. So wood elves begin at four foot six, and then we're gonna add two D 10 inches to his height. Change that to a two, come over. We're gonna uh, add six more inches. So this wood elf is going to be five foot even. There we go, five foot zero inches. Now, we are taking this same 6 that we rolled, and we're going to multiply it by 1d4 and add that to the base pounds of 100. So hit this, 2. So he's going to be 112 pounds. Bada boom. There we go. Nice and easy. Next up, before we get into storytelling, we should determine how old the character is. This is a step that maybe not a lot of players think about, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory fashion. Uh, you know, many of us might put them in 20s and 30s, uh, maybe even younger, right? Uh, especially if you like anime and we have, you know, the the, the strong, like the strong-willed teenagers going out, um, you know, fighting and adventure. Heck, you know, Pokemon, we had the, the 10-year-olds, 11, 12, going out into the world. There's nothing wrong with that. For what we're doing, though, because we're trying to leave things up to chance and then practice our storytelling around what we pull from the ether of nothingness, um, we should... Insert the age, because that is going to help determine how he, in this case, is going to act. Maybe a little bit of the demeanor. How long has this person um, been alive and been acting? Is he going to be in, you know, a seasoned uh, a seasoned elf? And this is his way of perhaps, uh, you know, if he's a level one adventurer and he's already 600 years old, does that mean that maybe he wants to repent for something that has happened in his life? Or if he's just a youngster elf, uh, where is this going to go? So, for this, we're going to need to roll a percentile die. Come back over here. 1d100. And the first thing we're looking for here is under character starting age. You see how if we roll a 1 to 5, this is a child prodigy, 6 to 35, young adult, and so on and so forth. This is what we're looking at. We rolled a 21. This is going to be a young adult. For my purposes, I write that up here as a reminder about the phase of life that he is going to be in. Now, we need to determine where in the young adulthood this character is. You see, elves here begin their cultural and intellectual adulthood at 100, and they die of natural causes around 750. <laughs> so a child prodigy would be maybe, you know, 80 to 100 or so. Um, a, a young adult is probably going to be, geez. Well, let's see. So we have young adulthood here. Then we have adulthood, midlife. So that's about 650 years between. So 250 would start midlife. Uh, so then if we go... 125 then could split between young adulthood and adulthood. So we're going to make a D6 
125. <laughs> and we're going to roll this and find out. We're going to add this number of years to 100 and see what we get. If you wanted to as well, if, if you're making a, uh, a hard number like this and you want to uh, incorporate, well, maybe our character is actually can be 100, right? Right on the cusp on that year. Um, you can just simply say, oh, well, then let's make it 126. And if we roll a one, that's actually the year, the cusp, the the year that they have their uh, their adulthood ceremony or their naming ceremony or whatever the the culture is going to entail. So we'll do that. We'll make this a 126, and we'll say if we roll a 1, it's 100 straight up. 112. So this character is 212 years old. That's a young adult, huh? <laughs> oh, he's still, he's still got that youthful, that hot blood. <laughs> okay. That is going to do it for our random rolls. We no longer are going to need this. Goodbye. Oh, we can... We'll just keep that open as reference if we need to, or we'll come back to it. So now, let's make this a little bit bigger. And actually, you know what? I don't think I have... Uh, I don't have any cool music playing. Here. Let's do this. There we go. All right. We're starting at background because your background is going to give you skill proficiencies and other starting bonuses that I don't want to have. Uh, oh, <laughs> that I don't want to have be uh, redundant in the race or class. Now, if you're making a character at home, you might start with race and class and go from there. If you find yourself having redundant skills, talk to your DM. Uh, he or she should be able to work with you and say, well, okay, I get where you're going and we can step to the side. And there's also nothing saying that you can't look in other sources for other backgrounds. Uh, the Sword Coast Adventures Guide has some. I believe Xanathar's Guide to Everything has some more. And you can just make up your own if you want to. Uh, eventually, uh, I will get to a point where we kind of do a D&D &D 201 uh, at some point in the session. And we're going to go beyond the scope of the PHB. But for a core of what I want to do with a lot of you, we're going to be just doing, you know, this is bread and butter basics. If you master this, it'll be so easy to incorporate splat books and other sources because you're going to have this memorized by rote. Okay. Here's our background. We were an acolyte, and it just so happens that alphabetically, here we go. You've spent your life in the service of a temple to a specific god or pantheon of gods. You act as an intermediary between the realm of the holy and the mortal world, performing sacred rites and offering sacrifices in order to conduct worshippers in uh, yeah, conduct them into the presence of the divine. You are not necessarily a cleric. Performing sacred rites is not the same thing as channeling divine power. Mm, pardon me. All right. So this is encouraging conversation with your DM, which you should always have conversation with your DM. Even if it's just, you know, buying him a slice of pizza so he gives you a 10th level spell. <laughs> Our skill proficiencies that the background is going to give us is going to be insight, right? We need to know if someone's lying, you know, kind of if it's a confessional thing. Or to be able to look into the nature of people if we're, you know, uh, if we're conducting ourselves in a, a holy manner. And of course, bing, 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 here's religion. We're going to get two languages of our choice. Well, we're going to skip a little bit ahead to Elven, and because we're going to start with Common and Elven. And then we are going to get two more. And I think I know what we're going to do, and uh, this is an easier choice because we know where we're operating uh, with some of the other characters that are up here. I'll get to that in a second, though, because I want to keep this character self-contained, and then we can bleed it over into what else we have going on. We have some starting equipment of a holy symbol. Let's go with a prayer wheel. Oops. Five sticks of incense. Vestments. 
which are your official, like your priestly garb when you're performing ceremonies. Not necessarily what you're wearing to walk down the road or go into a tavern or wherever you're going. That is our common clothes. And a belt pouch with 15 gold. It pays. Our background feature is going to be Shelter of the whoops, Faithful. As an acolyte, you command the respect of those who share your faith, and you can perform the religious ceremonies of your deity. You and your adventuring companions can expect to receive free healing and care at a temple, shrine, or other established presence of your faith, though you must provide any material components needed for spells. Those who share your religion will support you, but only you, at a modest lifestyle. You might also have ties to a specific temple dedicated to your chosen deity or pantheon, and you have a residence there. This could be the temple where you used to serve, if you remain in good terms with it, or a temple where you have found a new home. While near your temple, you can call upon the priests for assistance, provided the assistance you ask for is not hazardous and you remain in good standing with your temple. Personality traits. We have one in four. Looking at the chart, number one is I idolize a particular hero of my faith and constantly refer to that person's deeds as, oops, as an example. And number four, nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. Ah, to be young. <laughs> to be young and low-leveled. I remember when I was but a level four character. <laughs> oh, goodness. This is why storytelling is so much fun. All right, his ideal is one. Tradition. The ancient traditions of worship and sacrifice, there we go, I can spell, must be preserved and upheld. Now, it does indicate this is traditionally a lawful uh, a lawful ideal. If you are very new to D&D &D and you wanted to, you're making you know, your very first character and you say, well, I'm a lawful good character, this would probably be where you would choose to gravitate because it is a solid lawful ideal. We're a little bit more advanced than that. Um, and we can very well take this uh, this ancient traditions of worship, right? This this tradition in a neutral, good fashion, and still uh, be able to run it past uh, his personality uh, guardians of the idolization, right? He wants to preserve these, and so he remembers what this person did, and he wants to emulate it. And then nothing can shake my optimistic attitude. Yeah, you know the the lessons of the past are still alive and well. They serve everyone well, and oh, you know it's as. Um, you know, uh, so-and-so, as, as Barnaby used to say, this and that, even though we're in today's problems and we're having today's crisis of faith, um, you, you can see how we can still take this ideal and blend it into the character and through the character. Okay, his bonds was two. I will someday get revenge on the corrupt temple hierarchy who branded me a heretic. This is excellent, especially given the setting that we made just last night. This stuff writes itself. If you just trust yourself to do things randomly, as a DM or as a PC, oh, mwah, molto bene. It, this is going to work so well, and I will explain why. Hang on, just a little bit more. Um, now, revenge doesn't have to be, you know, Punisher style where he goes and he just, you know, slaughters everyone in the old temple. This could be bringing it to justice, exposing crimes, uh, exposing corruption. And so he's still good in doing good things. And even in the name of his faith, because it's these other people, these corrupt people that were bringing harm to it. And his flaws, because let's face it, we all have flaws, including our characters. Number six, once I pick a goal... I become obsessed with it to the detriment of everything else in my life. Okay, so does he obsess much? Yes, he obsesses over the past and maintaining it. He obsesses over this notion of getting revenge on the corrupt temple. 
and uh, he has this obsession to that he can be this cheery, wonderful person. Um, and even if it seems that it's creating a bit of a, a two-faced character, where we have the bright, cheery side, and then, oh, you don't want to make him angry. Anger doesn't break being good. It's what you do with that anger. <laughs> All right. Cool. We have our background installed. So now we can come up here and click on races. We're going to scroll down just a bit. There's our elves here. I, I skip over the first parts. I would urge you to read it. It's a good intro primer on who are elves and what do they do. And in fact, the, the book coming out in a little bit as of this video, uh, Morden Kanan's, um, oh heck, what's the full name? Morden Kanan's Guide to Something. It's, it'll even talk a lot about that, and especially the war between elves and drow. So it'll give them more personality, more understanding. What does it mean to be an elf? We, we as human beings, as players, can't live to be 600, 700, 750 years old. So you have to take, and you don't have to, but you should take a different view and a different attitude about life and decisions when you were talking about this kind of a scale for a natural lifespan. Okay, all elves increase dex by two. Uh, yep, we have our size. Our base walking speed is 30, right? Because we're a very standard medium-sized creature. We do get, as a background feature, dark vision to 60 feet. Meaning that in total darkness, we can see out to 60 feet as, it was, as if it was dim light. And uh, then it's kind of grayscale, right? Think like night vision goggles. And then dim light we can treat as bright light. And bright light, unless you're a drow or some other underground denizen, we just treat normally. Maybe, and you know, this is something that, uh, well, I'll cover in part two. But if you think about it, right, if, you, if your eyes have this ability, I don't know if they have like a reflective uh, retina, uh, kind of like what cats and some other animals do, or if it's just about the widening of the pupils. But if you have this ability... Uh, you have to imagine that there's different. There's ways that you can differentiate yourself, or why does this work like this? Keen senses. We have proficiency in the perception skill. There we go. That's nice. We also get fey ancestry, which means we have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put us to sleep. We also get what's called trance as an elf. This means that instead of needing to sleep or rest um, with, you know, read and lounge around for eight hours in order to get a long rest in, we can meditate for four hours and we'll get the same benefits. And even during that four hours, we're in a semi-conscious state. So we can we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll set up watch and you can watch and, um, you know, do your meditation and you'll get your spells back a little bit more quickly and uh, and, and you'll be set and ready. Uh, okay, languages, we already put that in there, common and elvish. And then we have the two sub-races of high elf, which we did not roll into. So coming down, bloop, wood elf. Our wisdom score increases by one, which is good for purposes of being a cleric. We get elf weapon training. Down here under weapons, we are going to get training in the long and short sword. And, whoops, long and short bow as well. Fleet of foot, we're actually going to get to increase our walking speed to 35 feet. And we get what's called Mask ooh, of the Wild. You can attempt to hide even when you're only lightly obscured by foliage, heavy rain, falling snow, mist, and other natural phenomena. There we go. Hmm. Uh, for those of you, if you're watching on YouTube or whatnot, I did the uh, the command random, uh, which it generates a random encounter. And it says that I sense someone or something approaching. Cautiously, I hail the figure, hoping it's my friend. Me? Is that you? <laughs> it, it suddenly responds. The ringer. Uh, Twitch emote. What do I do? 
Uh, I'm going to be very, very worried if um, <laughs> if I see myself approaching. And I'm going to have to wonder who's the real and who's the fake. Because obviously I am. But which? <laughs> Now we're going to pop over to classes and scroll, blinky blink, watch out. Here's our cleric. Clerics, by the way, in this edition, aren't just uh, casty healers. They can go up and bonk and be a frontline fighter. You can make them as a really powerful backline spellcaster. Clerics, um, they, they're they very diverse in this, especially depending on the domain that you, you choose. All right. Um... Hit dice, 1d8 per level. So we're going to sit at 48 hit dice. All right, He hasn't used any yet to heal himself between combats. And this is going to give us an idea about his hit points. Because at level 1, you start at maximum. So that's going to be 8 plus con mod plus 3 times con plus three times five, which is half plus one. Uh, so in this case, um, it, it just allows for easier leveling, and you know what to expect. Everyone's on the same page, you know how your hit points are going to advance, and it I find it uh, it's a lot more stable that way, though you can always do it with a random dice roll. Armor proficiencies. Let me pop back over here. Bada boom. Come down to armor. We are going to get light and medium armor. And actually, we're just going to do this. Light, medium shields. Because if you also add heavy, then we just add that. So light, medium, and shields. Just intrinsically to being a cleric. Weapons. All simple. No special tool proficiencies, and we didn't gain any by being an elf. So if you really wanted to, you could erase this, or maybe at some point in time you want to take the uh, a uh, uh, the feat to get training in tools, or you can just ask your DM and say, hey, is it okay if I start with proficiency in some kind of tools because of, I don't know, X, Y, or Z? And she or he might say yes. Again, always talk to your DM. All right, equipment, a mace or a warhammer if proficient. Well, we're not proficient in warhammers uh, because those are martial weapons. Scale mail, leather armor, or chain mail if proficient. I believe chain counts as heavy. So now it comes down to do we want to make a light armor dexterous cleric because you could do that. Uh, you can you can take things like the trickery domain, which could help accent that. But there's nothing saying you can't roll around in leathers. If you want to be dexterous, if you want to be able to jump out of the way of a fireball um, a little bit easier, that, that could bleed over into that too. So we need to decide what kind of armor he's going to be wearing. Scale mail, leather, or chain. Um, we're just going to put down armor of some kind. Our saving throws are going to be Wisdom and Charisma that we're going to be proficient in. And we get to choose two skills from History, Insight, Medicine, Persuasion, and Religion. Well, Acolyte gave us uh, Religion, so we don't have to worry about that. So we have History, which is Int. Uh, insight we already have, so we don't have to worry about that. Medicine is Wisdom, and Persuasion is Charisma. Hmm. Well, we have three choices, and this is also going to help us determine our stat spread about what we're wanting him to be good at doing. But we're reverse engineering it because we want to make a character first. We want to tell his story. Who is he? And then we will show a way to mechanically define that character in just a little bit. So let's, let's go back and look at his personality. This is why we do this first. This can help us decide if we're on the fence about skills. 
I idolize a particular uh, hero of my faith. So that's kind of leaning towards history, right? Especially if uh, he wants to uphold ancient traditions. So it seems that one of these should be history because it fits his character really well. Uh, and then what else? Oh, someday get revenge on the corrupt temple. Well, we have insight, so he might be able to do that. And once he become picks a goal, he becomes obsessed with it. Hmm. If he's if nothing can shake his optimistic attitude, that could also indicate. Uh, that could also indicate that he is very cheerful, right? He's neutral, good. And if he wants to try and rally people for this cause to purge his old temple um, or to convince people to come along on his goal, that seems to be speaking towards uh, charisma. And so he may not, uh, maybe he just didn't study medicine, right? He knows that he can take healing powers. So he doesn't need to know the name of the organs to be able to, uh, you know, shove them back in your body after, uh, after a fight and be able to, you know, cure up the wound. So I think in this case, we're going to go with persuasion. Now, if you wanted to make a more Healy Cleric, do that. It's just a simple uh, radio button to fill in. Well, on this PDF, if you print it out, just, you know, use a pencil. <laughs> Where's my mouse? There we go. All right. We're making really good progress tonight. Then we're going to get some more equipment from our class. that we didn't get to just yet because we, we got held up at the armor. A light crossbow or any simple weapon. Well, let's see. He gets proficiency with... He gets proficiency with a, a, a long and a short bow itself. Now, those are dex, meaning that if we did want to focus on a dexterous cleric, then... Uh, well, that and also a crossbow would mean uh, that we'd want to have some kind of a dex score, too. So maybe, maybe this is going to determine that we're going to start with leather armor. There we go. You could talk to your DM then. Well, a simple weapon would, uh, I think a short bow might fall under that. Um, but you could talk to your DM and say, oh, well, what if, um, what if I want to replace one of these with something else? Well, do so. Justify it. Um, you can even say, well, look, I have 15 gold. Would you give me, would you let me substitute it if I threw in two gold, three gold, five gold, something along those lines and negotiate, talk, build the character, get in, get in the mood, get in the motion. Um, let's say that, uh, for standard sake, uh, we'll just, uh, da -da -da. you know what? I will make this exception, right? You're my player. You're coming to me. I'm gonna say that we're starting with a longbow, and we're gonna make a we're gonna make a dex cleric, a priest's pack or an explorer's pack. By the way, if any of you are wondering why I'm reaching off camera here, I have a little calico devil who is who has been inadvertently summoned. Hi. She might want to play fetch. I'm not quite sure yet. I had her. She just wants some attention, which is weird because she doesn't like attention, but she likes getting attention. She just doesn't want to be responsible for holding on to it. Um, he's a he's a traditionalist. I think we can have him be the newcomer in town. Let's give him the priest's pack. A shield, and he gets a holy symbol, but he already got that by being an acolyte. So that's redundant. Um, pardon me, I'm going to drink something. Big cup of tea. <laughs> Sorry if that was rude. So you can say, oh, well, I get a holy symbol twice. Can I get, I don't know, a refund on that? Can I get the cost back from the shop? Um, can I apply that towards a longbow or upgrading armor? Or can I just take that in cash? Or can I replace it with another type of item? And again, we're having a conversation. All right, there's a couple more things that we can note while we're here and on this page. Our proficiency bonus at level four is a plus two. I'm, am I going to have to skin you and make a, make a new hat out of you? What's going on here? 
Hi. What do you want? Ma'am. What do you want? You don't have anything for me to throw. <laughs> oh, you know what? Uh, when, I, when I can get an emote here, maybe I'll just make it be a cat. <laughs> And scroll down to page three because we are spellcaster. Oh. Cleric four. So help me, ma'am. I'm gonna bonk your head lightly. And by bonk her head, I guess I mean I'm just gonna like pull her tail and scratch her and give her love and attention. On her terms, of course. Now we're gonna know four cantrips. And we're gonna have uh let's see. Let's do this one at a time. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I label spells like this so that I can track where they came from, at what level, or however it's appropriate. This is telling us we get four. I'm going to put four. At fourth level, we get four first level spells, spell slots, and three second levels. Now, the reason I say that and why there's not a spells known is as a cleric, you technically know every spell. Because the flavor is you're asking for miracles and favors and divine boons from your god or gods. And so when you wake up in the morning, it, as a part of your prayers, you say, oh, I'm going to face adversity. And so I, I hope for the strength to overcome this challenge. And that's going to manifest as a spell you have for the day. And so on and so forth. So the entire spell section, like all the clerics spells that exist are, are your spell book. And you don't even have a book. You just choose which ones that you're going to cast. Now, there is a limit, though, because you can only know so many spells from this infinite list. And so your prayers are going to be your, your spell list for the day. Hi. Do I have to lock you out at night? You're starting to get kind of ornery. I spoil them too much. <laughs> All right, so there's our cantrips. Preparing and casting spells. Um... So we prepare the list of cleric spells that are available for you to cast, choosing from the cleric spell list. When you do so, choose a number of cleric spells equal to your wisdom modifier plus your cleric level. The spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. Okay, whoops. So we need to actually go back and, uh, and fill in our abilities. It's now important to do so. However, we're going to drop this in real quick. Wisdom. We're going to need that for our spell save and our spell attack bonus anyway. Okay. Here's our standard array that we're going to take, and we want our, if we can, and not even in a min-maxing way, but we would like to try and keep our relevant attack stat high, so that way we aren't missing more often than not, or we're not falling behind. Now, if you want to play a support cleric, let's say, um, there's nothing saying that you can't be this frontline fighter, and you could take strength and heavy armor. And you're going to go nuts on the front line because a lot of support spells, it doesn't matter what your wisdom is. It's just that, can you cast it? Do you have the capability of casting the spell at all? Um, because there's no real modifiers or you don't have to roll to attack. So maybe you just get like a bunch of buff spells or some debuff spells or healing spells. Things that don't you don't have to maximize your, your wisdom to do. For this character, I'm going to put a 15 here then we should put a 14 let's see history that's important and religion all right we're gonna go 14 and then we're gonna go 13 uh, charisma is gonna be important 12 now this is a role play um, this is a role play challenge you can say we have a 10 and an 8 a 10 means that there's no bonus and 8 means there's a minus 1 is he sickly or frailer or do we want to put the eight in con and then just give him average strength or what probably a lot of people are going to say is well i'd rather have zero bonus hit points than lose hit points and we're going to go with the the eight in strength because he's probably not going to be lifting a bunch of stuff and in this case, I mean, we have a mace. We're not going to necessarily be good at bonking people with it. And you could talk to your DM and say, hey, what if I gave up the mace also? Can I get the longbow because that's more expensive? Or uh, can I get something else? Yeah, it's whatever it's going to be. 
Let's give him the 10 con and the 8 strength, though. Hi. I think I'm going to lock you out over the break. <laughs> I don't know what's getting into you. What do you want? Okay, so now we need to add in our racial modifiers, which is going to bring our wisdom to 16. Okay. Now our, our dexterity is going to bump up to 15. There we go. Get rid of those. I'm only going to put a symbol if it's a negative number. Otherwise, we don't need to double our keystrokes. This is going to be a 2 verging on a 3. This is going to be a 0. Rachie, can you take care of her, please? She's kind of acting up. Hopefully, you're not here to do the same. I have a kind of a big gray fuzzy slug in here now, too. They hear me talking to you, and maybe they're getting a little jealous. <laughs> Before we drop these numbers into our our saving throws and our skills, we need to apply that ability score increase, right? We hit level four, we're going to get one of those, and an ability score increase means you can level up uh, one stat by two points or two stats by one point. What we could do here, if we really wanted, was bring was is bump up his wisdom to 18 and give him a four, or we can use one point and get his dex up to the next level and then put his wisdom on the verge of getting that next bump. It's whatever's more important to your character. Here, we're making him kind of dexterous. Uh, we can make him kind of a, a sit back and he can uh, use his bow into combat and do some casting because he'll be pretty good there too. So he has a three dex and a three whiz. Now that we have this taken care of, we can fill in some more uh, some more spaces. For instance, your initiative is your dex. Armor, uh, he's wearing leather. That's 11 plus dex is going to be 14 plus a shield. If he's not, you know, too, uh, if he's not having um, uh, two-handed for his bow. Um, but let's say that he's going around with a mace or we can give him another uh, weapon that will make good use of his dex. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, so that's 10 plus 3 is 13 plus a shield, or I'm sorry, it's an 11 with the leather. 14, his armor class is 16. Haha! -ha. Con, so we're not really going to worry about that, because that's 0. This is also 0. So we're going to add 8 to 15, and we're going to come up with 23 hit points. And he's sitting at 23 because he hasn't had combat yet. <laughs> Minus one. Three. Con is zero. Int is two. Wisdom is three. Oop, I'm sorry, that's going to be five. We had his proficiency, right? And his charisma is going to be three. There we go. Acrobatics. So we're looking at dex. This is going to be three. And then there's some other deck skills down here at the bottom. Slide a hand in stealth. Animal handling is wisdom. That's going to be three. Insight is going to be five because he's proficient. Medicine is a three. Perception is a five. And survival is a three. Next up is Arcana. This is intelligence. Two. Four. Two, two, four. Now we have athletics. This is the only strength based one. Minus one. And lastly, charisma. One, 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 and three. Okay. So far, so good. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask, and I'll be happy to, uh, I'll be happy to engage in conversation with you all about it. I want to make sure that um, as I'm doing this, nothing's going over your head, or if you're wondering why I made a decision on something, everything here has a reason, right? We're very purposely creating this character. Passive Wisdom Perception is going to be 10 plus our bonus, so he has a 15. All right, now that we have these, 
we're going to come down to page, uh, whoop, page three. Our spell save DC is eight plus proficiency, which is two, plus wisdom modifier, which is three. So 13. And we're going to be getting a plus five for our spell attack bonus. So if we do cast a spell that we need to roll to hit, that's the number you're going to use. And this is going to give us our wisdom modifier plus our cleric level. So that's going to be four plus three is uh, seven spells prepared. We're going to get some bonuses, though. Hang on, because we need to apply his domain also. So don't think, oh my gosh, what, what our cleric's doing? Only seven spells. They're going to get some domain spells that are right over here. Okay, they do get ritual casting. Uh, stuff like ritual casting and spell casting focus, um, I don't I don't list those. Those are kind of redundant, and they're all included in being able to, to cast spells. Each domain has a list of spells. It's domain spells that you gain as, a, as the cleric levels noted in the domain description. Once you gain a domain spell, you always have it prepared, and it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. If you don't have, or if you have a domain spell that doesn't appear in the cleric spell list, the spell is nonetheless a cleric spell for you. <laughs> and then we can come up here to class. We get channel divinity. At second level, you gain the ability to channel divine energy directly from your deity, using that energy to fuel magical effects. You start with two such effects: turn undead and uh, and an effect determined by your domain. By the way, if uh, you all can see on the camera here, this is the little calico hellion that has been demanding attention. Uh, so it looks like she's coming up here and she might want some from you too. Hmm? Are you going to rub on my mic? Create a little D&D &D ASMR? Hey, no. Hi. What's this? It's over here. No, oh, she's being shy now, right? You can see her tail. <laughs> At least she's not giving you the old eye of Sauron, if you know what I'm saying. All right, so <laughs> we are. I'm just listing these. It, you as a player, I would expect you to know them if I'm running for you, that you don't need to turn back. So you can write this in if you're doing this and you weren't sure, or you'd just be able to refer to it or just see the, the title and know how it functions. For what we're doing here, I'm just putting down that you have it and you can go back and reference what it does and how it works. So there's our turn undead. And we're just shy of getting this fifth level when we can destroy Undead with our turning. And there's, yeah, that's what we got for fourth level. So our Divine Domains, we're going to skip past Knowledge, which kind of makes you like, um, uh, in prior editions, it was called a, a Mystic Thurge. It was a combination like Wizard Cleric. It was very interesting. You could take spells from uh, both these lists, and it made you really adaptable and, and very interesting so th that's kind of a way to do a mystic third or if you just want to be like this very learned scholar um you know someone who r realizes that magic exists in different forms and but you still like follow a, a deity's example or you praise one for free maybe it's the deity of magic itself there's a lot of things you can do with that uh life domain light domain here we go this is what we randomly rolled up um so we're gonna get a uh couple things let's scroll down here our light domain spells at first level i'm going to list domain so that we know we always have this and this is different than the other spells that we prepare we are going to get burning hands and also fairy fire Oh, thank you, notification. <laughs> At third level, we're going to get um, Flaming Sphere and Scorching Ray, which I do believe are second level. That would make sense because that's what we can only learn. So, Domain, Flaming whoop, Sphere, and 
domain scorching ray. And we get a bonus cantrip. When you choose this domain at first level, you get the light cantrip if you don't already know it. There we go. Warding Flare. Also at first level, you can interpose divine light between yourself and an attacking enemy. When you are attacked by a creature within 30 feet of you that you can see, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll, causing light to flare before the attacker before it hits or misses. An attacker that can't be blinded is immune to this feature. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, a minimum of once. Uh, you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. We'll keep the we'll keep the other uh, the archetype or in this case the domain type uh, channel divinity up here because that uh, we get it by being a cleric. But we will put in warding flare here under archetype. Now the one that we get here is radiance of the dawn. Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to harness sunlight, banishing darkness and healing radiant damage to your foes. Uh, and dealing, I'm sorry. As an action, you present your holy symbol and any magical darkness within 30 feet of you is dispelled. Additionally, each hostile creature within 30 feet of you must make a constitution saving throw. A creature takes radiant damage equal to 2d10. This is at second level. That's that's a lot. 2d10 plus your cleric level on a failed saving throw and half as much on a successful one. A creature that is total cover from you is not affected. And we're not high enough to get improved flare or potent spell casting. So, we're not going to worry about that. This is what we have at level four. He'll grow up and he'll be a big boy in another couple hundred years, and uh, and he'll be good to go from there. Hey, hey! Looks like I just uh, won against a random, uh, random monster in a battle. I I do these things on the side. It keeps uh, you know it keeps things fun and uh, it's fun and fresh. <laughs> All right, now that we have this, we can, we, we have seven additional spells that we can prepare, and I'll go over some of the spells, and we can come up with a generic, like, he would wake up, and on any given day, he would have these spells prepared. This can change uh, every day, so if you're playing a cleric, it's important to know what you can cast uh, at any level, because you are adaptable on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what else can we do here? So the mace is uh, simple. We will get proficiency, but we're at minus one strength. Uh, so we're just going to give him a plus one. And let's go down to equipment and look at this real quick. A mace is 1d6 bludgeoning. 1d6 minus one <laughs> bludgeoning. However, we're going to do something here. We're going to give him a longbow. And if we wanted to replace the mace, just as a heads up, um, we could probably give him something like he can use uh, he can use a dagger, which has the finesse property and use his dex to his advantage. Or, um, you know, a light crossbow or a short bow does fall into a simple weapon as well that he can use. Now, he's proficient with a longbow, and that's what we're going to have him use. But whatever, if he wants to carry a mace and you can use it in role-playing to look ferocious, even if he's not particularly strong, or you could replace it with something else that you can um, that you can use. Hmm. A sling would be interesting as well. But we're going to give him a dagger as a simple weapon. It's always good to carry a dagger on you. So in this case, we can use uh, we can get a plus five, right? Because we can use a dagger with finesse. It's going to be one d four plus three piercing, and a longbow is going to be also a plus five. And we come down here, a longbow is one d eight plus three piercing. There we go. 
And uh, I'll talk about this in the second half, but we can take this character and maybe we can do some interesting things with the longbow. I'll, I'll get to it and how we can differentiate PCs from other PCs or, you know, you, you like a concept of a character, but you don't want everyone to say, oh, you're that, you're that guy or you're that girl. Uh, th I'll give you some cool tips and tricks to uh, get around that. Okay, uh, no tools. I think we're good there. Everything is really coming together well. I'm going to erase this because our character is going to need a name. So if, if a name or these physical details are starting to come to mind, you're seeing who he is and how he operates, and, and you're, you close your eyes and boom, this is what you think of, please feel free to share it. And this is our character. This isn't mine. We're building this person together and we're inserting him into a world that we all have made. Spells, Cleric. So we get light for free. Resistance, Sacred Flame, Spare the Dying, Thaumaturgy. Uh, let's see. If you have a question on a specific spell, please ask, and I will go to that spell's entry and narrate it for you. But I don't want to do that with each of the spells we, we pick because that will take a, that'll take a long time. Guidance would be appropriate for role-playing reasons, and it's not a bad spell all around to take as a cantrip. Gets light. Mending is always useful, right? You can mend your own clothes, and you can polish up your armor, and you can do things along those lines. Um, if maybe he's... Uh, as a way to make money, as a way to be self-sustaining, as a way to help other people if he's very helpful, uh, mending would be a, a good way, like a good cantrip to know in the background. Uh, definitely... Sacred Flame, I would suggest, you know, you have an attack cantrip of some kind. That way you always have a backup if needed. They do scale up at, le at later levels, so you're not just stuck with a, a little, like, you know, Bic lighter when you're level 15. Um, he doesn't know about medicine, uh, necessarily, but we can give him Spare the Dying as a way to help out and provide a little bit of on-the-spot um, anti-death. <laughs> I don't know if healing is the right word for it, but uh, prevention from dying. And thaumaturgy allows for the creation. Like it's a, uh, it's it's a bit like prestidigitation. It can do a lot of little effects. It can create a little flame. It could turn something a color. You can produce minor uh, minor visual effects with it. If we have someone who is a cleric of light i can see where this could be uh, something that would come in handy and useful especially if you can create fire um, i mean yeah you have sacred flame but you can do it in a way that just won't set like a barn on fire if you miss <laughs> all right so those are locked in that's what we know now we get to choose seven more spells as we want split between first and second level we could go six and one if we want. We can go four and three. We can go five and two. It's it's up to us. First level, Bane, that imposes disadvantage. Then we have Bless. Bless is really good. Uh, command, uh, create or destroy water, cure wounds. Um, uh, detect evil and good. Detect magic. Detect poison and disease. Guiding bolt, healing word, inflict wounds, protection from evil and good. Purify Food and Drink, Sanctuary, and Shield of Faith. Well, he is wearing some light armor here. These aren't necessarily going to be in alphabetical order, but we can put in Shield of Faith. Hmm, pardon. Definitely, we're going to want to Cure Wounds. Now, we are taking an entry of each. We can cast Cure Wounds four times, right? We have four first-level spell slots. That just means we don't cast the others. Or we can take Cure Wounds as level 1 and uh, run it through level, a level 2 spell slot and get an increased potency for it. Again, he's waking up on an average day. This is what, he, this is what he's going to wake up and have um, after he prays. Hmm, let's see. He enjoys history. He's optimistic. He is a Cleric of Light. It kind of reminds me of, like, Misandra from uh, Game of Thrones, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, 
Let's do detect magic. That's a good utility one. And bless. There's four. Now let's choose three first or three second levels. Aid, augury, ooh. Augury would be good because that will help uh, provide answers on where can I find people of my temple or even just generic. Uh, how do I how do I rescue the miners that have been under the salt mine collapse? That's a reference to the map. Hmm, daylight would be in his idiom, but he can already dispel darkness with his um, his uh, channel divinity. So maybe let's do. Protection from energy. That gives resistance to a, a damage type. That could be good. And... If he's here and he's helping, there's a lot of mining going on. We could probably do... Let's see, he also gets Spirit Guardians, Tongues, and Water Walk. Let's do meld into stone because there's a mine nearby. So if he's in the city and he knows that, maybe he's called in to rescue some miners if there's a collapse because that happens and heal them. Hey, Delcorn, greetings to you. Uh, sorry if I if you said that a, a minute ago and I, I only just caught it. So there we go. There's our there's our spell list for the day for this character. He is pretty good to go here. Lots of room for a backstory, and I'll, I'll find something that would be a good uh, that'd be a good character appearance. Like a oh, thank you for hosting, uh, Delcorin. So he's pretty well complete. We just need a name and some physical features. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to I'm going to take a short rest, although I'm not going to take a full hour to do so, and I'm going to uh, I'll throw up the uh, the interim screen and go and you know drink some tea and do a stretch and find out oh, what this cat wants <laughs> and change my hat too, and then we'll come back and we can springboard our character uh, if you have a name or other traits list them in chat. I'll throw them in during the break too. And then I will use this as an example about ways that you can differentiate your PC from another from another party members or from stereotypes or from things along those lines as we go into part two, which is going to be some PC advice.